I will say hello. Welcome, everyone. I'm Charlie Melcher, the founder of the Future of Storytelling Summit. And we're delighted to have you all here today for uh, our weekly Google Plus Hangout. We're very honored to have Jake Barton with us. Hi, Jake. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me. Jake is the principal and founder of Local Projects, uh, amazing uh, interactive design firm that's won three National Design Awards or, or National Design Award finalist. Um, and I was amazed to read recently, Jake, that uh, your company was listed by Fast Company as uh, one of the top firms helping to redefine emotional storytelling. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's just a great, great context or, or way to set up the discussion for today. Um, I also just wanted to um, bring to people's attention the recent project you did at the Cleveland Museum of Art um, and their interactive Gallery One, which is uh, an amazing example, I think, of being able to bring uh, a human experience and technology together to create really a whole new kind of interaction and experience that, that wouldn't have been possible beforehand. So w welcome. Um, let's, let's just start and ask everyone else to say hi and introduce themselves. Uh, Gideon, why don't you say hi? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Gideon Darkangelo. I'm the head of creative strategy at ESI Design in New York. We're an experiential design firm. A signature project for us over the past couple of years was we got a chance to do one of the pavilions at the Shanghai World Expo, which I think feeds into some of the themes of today's conversation. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, and Jenny? Hi. Uh, I'm Jenny Moore. I'm associate curator at the New Museum in New York City. Currently, we have an exhibition on view, NYC 1993, Experimental Jet Set Trash and No star and um, an aspect of our exploration of New York City 1993 includes a campaign recalling 1993 where you can call in from any payphone in New York City and hear stories of uh, residents or, or people from that neighborhood remembering that time. Amazing. Perfect for today's conversation. Welcome. Um, and Ed, hi. Hi, Charles. Um, uh, I'm Ed Bertinsky. Uh, I'm a photographic artist. Uh, I've been showing in museums around the world, uh, from Asia to Europe to here as well. I just wrapped up a big show on oil, and I'm just launching a, a big show on water uh, in New Orleans, uh, which I thought was an appropriate place to do that. And uh, so we're trying to enrich that experience as well. We've got a, um, a room that's going to be uh, video projections and showing uh, the process of the making of the water project in the film. Uh, and also uh, we've been working with Charles. We've done an app for the oil book, and, and now we're in discussions of doing uh, an app and an iBook for the uh, water book. So I'm doing book. Uh, media uh, through through the iPad and also um, exhibitions with the fine prints and um, a movie. So it's it's a multiple um, engagement with all kinds of media. My um, name is Marcus Schubert. I work with Ed. Um, I'm the director of uh, publications and exhibits um, here at the studio, and uh, we work very closely uh, to produce the exhibitions and uh, the books and. Uh, Essentially, I'm the one that travels to uh, any of the major exhibition locations to uh, basically uh, supervise the installation and the lighting and to make sure all the I's are dotted and no T's are crossed, etc. Great. Well, thank you. So nice to have everyone here. Um, so, Jake, why don't you start by just telling us a little bit about the work you've just done with the Cleveland Museum? Sure. I'm going to try something adventurous. Uh, with a screen share and hopefully you'll be able to see uh, what's actually happening. This is a video. Can you see this? Just say gallery one. Um, this is a presentation of what we're doing at the Cleveland Museum of Art, uh, which is a, a new installation that incorporates technology along with the visitor experience in a variety of different ways. We're, just we're basically you're just seeing a black screen? OK, that's what I'm afraid of. All right, I'm going to stop doing this then. Uh, and then I'll just talk about it. Essentially, we were tasked to look at a uh, way to increase visitor engagement at the same time that they were doing a large expansion for the museum. So they invested $350 million in architecture, essentially doubling 
their gallery size and at the same time decided to build out a new capacity for audiences. And so we built out a range of new interfaces, everything from using image recognition to look at people's face. So as you're making different facial gestures, it's searching the collection and drawing forth artworks that connect with you based on the faces that you're making. Or we have a large scale collections wall that shows all 3,000 artworks at the same time so that visitors can search and, and move through the collection with their own curiosity, connect together different artworks, and then actually load it onto an iPad which creates a visitor-created tour of the museum. Uh, and all of this was in a way to both open up the museum as a platform for visitors themselves to express their own interests and to share that with other people, but also to make emotional connections between visitors and the artworks in really unexpected and surprising ways. Uh, we have, for example, we talked for a long time with the curators about the ways in which figurative sculpture, so the actual body posing uh, within figurative sculpture is a large part of the artwork. People just think about the, the actual sculpting process as the main artistic expression. But we thought it was amazing the fact that you're in front of these bodies that are much like your body and actually people have essentially been representing other people since the beginning of art itself. That's the first thing that we drew when we could draw things is other people. And so we have this body detection application that allows people to essentially pose like figurative sculptures and be connected directly with them and actually be rated on how closely they're able to mimic the sculptures themselves, therefore almost embodying these, these physical bodies of other humans from past years and decades and centuries even. So that's a, a really brief overview in terms of the Cleveland Museum of Art. And I think, for us at least, it was really important, and I'm super interested to hear what everyone has to say in this topic, to really focus uh, the experience on the experience and on the humanity and on the ideas that the artists, uh, as well as the, the audience, are really putting forward. So much of technology uh, these days is, is presented to people, marketed to audiences, really as technology for technology's sake. It can create marketing, it can create buzz, but I think to really sustain any product or technology, whether it's an iPhone or whether it is something in a museum experience, it really needs to actually deliver some type of a, a value in human connection. And in the case of artworks and storytelling and getting deeper into the artist's vision, into the process of making things, and into understanding the nature of the artwork and the human experience itself. Um, so with that, I'd love to hear uh, what other people have been either seeing or experiencing uh, in terms of these different approaches. Um, I know that the New Museum, for example, has had a really interesting approach to embedding narratives within the urban landscape, within the, the payphones themselves. I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about that, Jenny. Uh, sure. I mean, the, the, that idea very much came out of the exhibition itself which was um, we decided to look back at the 90s. Uh, there was a, a group of, of four curators, um, Massimiliano Gioni, Gary Carrion Moriari, Margot Norton, and myself, uh, who were considering art of the 90s. And we kind of honed in rather quickly on the year 1993 as being formative for a number of reasons. Um, both, we kind of located it as the beginning of this globalization of the art world. There were a number of significant exhibitions that, that year that, that sort of presaged either movements in art or important figures that have now become, you know, sort of the, the some of, among the most important artists working in contemporary temporary art. Um, and also, we were thinking about uh, culture and politics that year. But, but it really started from this idea of, OK, if we're looking at 1993 and, and with the changes that have happened since then, we were kind of telling each other these stories of, I think, once you locate a place and a time, you immediately situate yourself to that. So as curators, we immediately said, OK, if we're thinking about New York in 1993, where were we? What were we doing in 1993? And as we were starting our research with that, everybody else started to kind of play that game too. Were you in New York? Did you know what was going on in New York? Because the exhibition is is uh, singularly focused. Well, we call it a core sampling. By no means is it definitive. <laughs> we would never uh, declare that, but a core sampling of artwork uh, made or exhibited in New York in 1993. But when people look back, because it is 20 years, which is an, also an interesting time, it's a, it's a it's a living history. You know, it's close enough that I think all of us remember 1993, but, you know, 20 years 
is is a history. But we all started playing that game of where was I? What was I doing? Was that in 1993? Was that movie in 93? Was that album in 93? And that became a really important part of our experience in terms of the research. And then as as we sort of branched out and were talking with artists or critics or curators, everybody started playing that game and locating themselves, even if they weren't in New York in 1993, this idea of that was the last great gritty period of New York City, that was the year that Giuliani was elected, uh, and I think we can all say that that's very much changed the, the, the physical, the economic, the cultural landscape of the city. Um, and so an aspect of that, working with Droga 5, that, that we work with in terms of our exhibitions and advertising campaigns are different ways to kind of um, bring, uh, you know, the, the, the visitor or people uh, you know, to give them access to the exhibition, uh, we brought it out into the streets. And so we've activated every payphone in New York City. So if you pick it up and you call the number 1-855-4-1993, you hear a story being told of someone who lives in that neighborhood or lived in that neighborhood in 1993 or their reflection of that time. And it's been extraordinary in terms of this, you know, collective imagining of a, of a city that if you're calling from the payphone, you're in New York City and what, you know, that street corner looked like 20 years ago, what that person was doing 20 years ago. You know, there's one uh, about the meatpacking district and the smell literally of like the blood and the meat in the streets. So it's been a really incredible way of people engaging with the time and a place, but always coming, we hope, coming back to the experience of the art made at that time, which is what's on view with the new museum. So it's been an interesting mm -hmm. threading together of people relating to something. I mean, for the new museum, it is always very much about the primary experience of the art. But since it is a show about New York and the, the culture and the fabric of the city, how could we, in some ways, engage the city, you know, literally within the experience of the exhibition? And so it, it's become a really dynamic interchange in terms of, of uh, you know, Know, people thinking back to a time and then coming to a place and looking at art from that time. It's been a really dynamic exchange. Super interesting. I'm wondering from, because that idea of layering context around the work itself, I feel, mm -hmm. uh, is, a, is a deep and arguably controversial way that museums are thinking about displaying work, meaning we're now doing work we're engaged with SFMOMA and the capacity to show context around the artworks is really a is really a challenging point of conversation both with the curators and with the artists themselves because obviously particularly in terms of modern art the, the artwork is the experience so putting experience around that experience can oftentimes uh, be a challenge uh, from the curator standpoint maybe from the artist standpoint and maybe from the visitor standpoint as well I was wondering um, you know, Ed, if you could maybe talk a little bit about your work and how you see interpretation working as an experience and how people looking at your artworks can get deeper into the subject material either before or after uh, actually viewing the artworks and the exhibitions themselves. If I can just jump in and add to that before, Ed, before you respond, you know, one of the things that I find so amazing about both examples of uh, museum design or exhibition design that you've both described is that you really let the museum goer become a participant in making this art, in having some experience of understanding through their own physical interaction with the experience. Um, and so I wonder, Ed, it's another way of framing the question, Jake, that you just put, which is, are, are you comfortable as an artist letting the audience really participate and in a way be part of the act of creation of their own experience with with your art? Uh, well, I mean, I think what I do, you know, falls more within kind of the traditional exhibition uh, of, of a, an artist, or like in my case, a photographer's work, where I create a, you know, like in the case of, for instance, the Corcoran oil show, you know, I create a, a body of work of, you know, 55, 60 images, uh, they're sequenced, they're lit, you go from one room to another, there's a progression of ideas, there's an arc, you know, so that, that, that that's built. So, at, you know, that the, that at the end of the show, what we're hoping is that the cumulative effect of, of all these images and, and the presence and being the presence of these images, which is very different, different than um, all other 
forms of seeing the work, whether it's through the web or my webpage or on the web or through a book um, uh, or in, in a movie. These are all mediated experiences of the actual work. So I'm making things that, that I want people to stand in front of, the actual object, the photograph itself. So, you know, for me, that's an important uh, experience that I'm working towards. That's the stage to which I work to, is the print, how it's lit, and the viewer, and how they receive that print. Um, so that's the primary thing that I'm delivering through the museum experience. Other contextual things that I try to build in is actually the choice of where I show and open the work up. For instance, the Corcoran was, you could see the White House from from the Corcoran Gallery. When they asked me, did I want to do a sh did I want to do a show with them? I said, I want to do a show on oil because that building over there, the White House, has more to do with the flow of oil around the planet than any, any other building in the world. So, so to have that, I didn't plan on doing an oil show. It happened because of the context of the museum across mm. the street. When I wanted to do a show on water, which other city other than New Orleans has had a, a profound relationship with water in many ways? whether it's the oil spill or whether it's Katrina, and it's a city recovering from the effects of, uh, of water uh, and to have an exhibition start off there, again, sets the kind of uh, the ethos of the project, the, the kind of looking deeply into the substance that we've inherited on the planet called water and where's the right place for it, which adds a layer of context that isn't necessarily interactive, but it's meaningful to the people uh, uh, who are in that city and who do understand you know, how deeply the subjects that I'm working are connected to to, to their cities. Also, and, I guess. And, uh, um, can, sorry, go ahead. Um, just uh, in terms of interactive uh, uh, aspects to these exhibitions, we've worked with uh, with Charlie to to develop an app for the uh, for the oil, but it's more like a it's more like a an ebook. A version of the oil book, um, which has a lot of uh, fairly rich um, uh, extras to it, um, like Ed going through the exhibition, and so videotaped uh, Ed, you know, speaking about the exhibition, speaking directly about certain images and his process, um, and as well audio portions, um, interactive maps, things that people could. Access in the gallery situation on uh, in um, from iPads. So, for instance, in London, I think there was uh, four or five iPads in a in a sort of separate gallery where people could go and, in fact, interact with the the, the larger story, the larger context, uh, of the texts and the audio portions uh, directly while they were in the uh, exhibition. Um, in terms of interactivity, that's about as far as we've gone. Um, um, the the water show is also going to have a, s a separate gallery, essentially that will uh, show a process, a screening, a screening of a film about the process of putting uh, a big exhibition like this together. So it is uh, travels with uh, Jennifer Bashwall, um while he's co-directing this water film, which is a documentary film about this project. Um, uh, there's all kinds of footage that's going to be used and cut together so that, in fact, um, you'll be able to, as an audience member, kind of see Ed at work behind the scenes. Um, but uh, over and above that, in terms of interactivity, I don't think that we've really explored the kinds of things that you, you, you all are addressing, which uh, may or may not be something that we could look at at some point. But, well, yeah. I did want to make a distinction that, that I think is something that Ed also clarified in that um, the, the recalling 1993 aspect of the exhibition, we don't consider that to be an art. I mean, to us, it's very much the experience of the sculptures, paintings, videos, photographs. To us, that is the work. That is the core of the 1993 exhibition. This is a different way of involving people, but to me there is a real distinction mm -hmm. between the primary experience that you have with a painting, a sculpture, with a, with a work of art that was also made, if you're talking about something made in 1993, it wasn't made to engage with, you know, it, it, was, it was a very different time in, in terms of the, the technical landscape, the kind of social landscape, and so um, we are trying to, you know, support the distinction that, that this uh, project is 
an aspect of the exhibition, but to us that's that's still very different from the art that that the exhibition is 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 offering showing to the audience. So I think if if I may say with Ed, it was this mm -hmm. distinction of you know there is a very different experience that you have with art, and then you have this other kind of experience that can that that can thread into it. But for us, it, it is important that. Um, you know, an artist didn't make this recalling 1993, but it's a way to open up other areas of experience in terms of what the show does. So to us, there there is a real distinction there. Yeah, I think if I might uh, add in uh, to that, the uh, uh, I think the, the question that we're all circling around is what does it mean to participate in an exhibit as a visitor? And, you know, uh, I liked, uh, Jake, one of the things you said about the Cleveland Museum um, somewhere about it, it not be about uh, interact, uh, interacting with the interactive, but that the interactive was a facilitator to uh, help you see the work more deeply or uh, uh, something along those lines, and that it was a facilitator for participation. And uh, that there's a spectrum that we're just beginning to look at about what does it uh, mean to participate, either to engage more with a piece of, like a piece of work such that, Ed, you've created that's really there for itself versus on the whole other end of the spectrum, a collaborative composition of some kind, you know, where all the visitors together are making something together. That's really where uh, uh, our work at ESI uh, Design has been focused on is how can we get people in a group together to make something together, and that's a whole other level of uh, participation, participation and interaction, which uh, opens up a whole slew of issues. <laughs> Uh, in the art museum, it may not be the most appropriate place for that, but in a, for a, perhaps a science museum or on another team. Uh, the Shanghai Pavilion that I was referring to earlier, the whole theme of the expo was uh, how can we imagine a better city and a future? So our approach to that was to try to create ways which a group of people collaboratively could envision that together, and that was the, the message. A whole different set of techniques related to that. Jake, I don't know if you'd uh, had anything to say about that spectrum from really participating versus facilitating an interpretation. Yeah, I think what's interesting is that um, it's a moving target. When we began our work uh, at Local Projects just a decade ago, it was really anathema to allow visitors to participate in any way. And within that time, you know, we started with a project called StoryCorps, which is this national oral histories project with people interviewing each other. Uh, and now we're working on the 9-11 Memorial Museum, which is about as center and uh, in some ways conservative because of its stature, a project as you can get. And, you know, visitor stories and experiences are at the heart of that museum. So we've really seen a radical inversion um, outside, particularly of art museums, I think one of the reasons that Cleveland Museum of Art, the Gallery One project, is is resonating so much is that art museums have been, um, in some ways, uh, sort of maybe waiting uh, and and holding back on innovating or changing their visitor experience. I think because of this sort of competing uh, this this competition for people's attention issue which which Ed was talking about and, and Jenny were talking about where you know the artworks themselves are really the experience of course there are artworks now that are meant to be experiential and participatory by their very nature and that's a whole other sort of vein of work um, but I'm interested in in finding ways and, and Ed, maybe you can think about this or talk about this um, that you know for people who actually are really in love with the work and are, are studying the pictures themselves, how you can imagine, uh, I guess, the way you think about it with like an ebook or with a, um, a gallery guide is you, you have an experience with the work and then you go off and you can sort of uh, experience it deeper either by watching the documentary or looking at the, the videos of you walking through the galleries themselves. I'm constantly trying to challenge uh, the client to imagine the, the, the best of the best experience of, for example, an Edward Kinsky show, like what, what's the experience that the, that the chairman of the board of the Corcoran gets when maybe you, Ed, or the head curator can walk them through the gallery experience and sort of make sort of whispered overtures about specific works and then hang back while they commune and meditate on another work. Like how can we transform that into an experience that every visitor can have? Like that's at least my best case scenario. It's like how can you get to that sort of like 
pure place where you can both meditate on the work when you need to, but that you can have an expert or even the artist themselves sort of whisper to you about experiences with the artworks or things that they thought about with the artworks or stories about creating the artworks so that it does become a deeper experience uh, for people who just love the work and want to know more and experience more about it. Um, well, one of the things that, um, you know, quite often happens in a museum experience now is that, you know, you, you can get somebody or the artist, if there's a live still or a curator speaking about the works and you stop in front of image number 15 and, and you get, you know, a, a, a voiceover talking through that particular image. And that's really become a large part of the museum experience to get a richer reading of a particular piece of work and how you know, critics have seen it, how the public seen it, how the artist has seen it, uh, and that gives them a kind of a layered kind of experience with understanding the work, you know, in a way they couldn't by just standing in front of it if they didn't have a history of that piece. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've seen happen, I mean, with the iPads in the London show with the, uh, with the app um, on oil, there was a lot of interest in you know, trying to go deeper, seeing that, you know, when you go to that image and there's a speaker in the corner, you can hit it, and that's me talking about the image, uh, what I was seeing, you know, why I took it, uh, you know, some anecdotes around it that might be interesting for, for you to know about. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, from doing lectures and things like that, I found that people are, are very interested in knowing a bit of the backstory, knowing a bit more of the context of that image that they can't get from just standing in front of the piece. Mm -hmm. um, so I've seen that, that, that those kind of augmenting uh, that with, um, I, I like the iPad in a way better than a kind of, um, you know, the, the headphone walkthrough because I think what happens when I see people doing that, they almost walk past all the other images and go to the next one. It right. almost kind of guides them so directly to that, that they, the unaided experience almost becomes, well, that's not an important enough image to stop because this, this tells me to go to that next image. So, but, I, but if you go to a, like a separate place, a separate room where you can go more in depth with an iPad and go in there, explore it at, at your own will and say, I was interested in that image. Uh, let, me, let, let, let me see what it has to say about that. I think that also may be more enriching and a little bit less intrusive in terms of how you experience the whole show. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't put that hierarchy within the show itself. The other thing I've seen some of the oil show is it's traveled to about twelve locations and and they've also engaged children so there've been rooms along the side where you know in the oil show there was a whole thing on recycling so they had all kinds of tin cans and things and they would bring kids and little camps in there to to, to work with those materials they could take pictures of them and put them together make sculptures out of them uh, do different things with with something for for kids to kind of you know, riff off of the work and do something that's kind of fun using materials that would normally be seen as, as waste material. Uh, I've seen other places where they've asked the question, can you see our world without oil? What, you know, what do you think? And then people would put yellow posting notes and there'd be a whole wall of oh, wow. people's comments about, well, do, well, can I imagine a world without oil? You know, and that kind of, you know, getting the viewer to experience the show at the end to, to reflect on it, and then you can see what other people have say, said about our world with or without oil. So that that's another way to kind of, in a, in a way, without forcing the, you know, it's a voluntary gesture. It's not forcing the viewer into something that they may feel uncomfortable with doing, but if they feel they have something to say, there's a format for them to say it as well. That's great. And do you feel like that works, particularly with your work, because it is socially engaged and because you're trying to, maybe even ask that same question with the work and then you can explicitly ask visitors that question at the end? Yeah, well, I think it, I think that, that experience, I think people, I mean, I think that if I'm not mistaken, the museum experience, whenever I'm in New York or I go to, it, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's becoming more and more popular. It's becoming more of a, a destination for people um, to do something on, a, on the weekend or, or to go and experience something. So I think it's a, I feel it's a growing uh, um, phenomena of, of uh, museum goer, you know, goers, you know, enjoying going to galleries and seeing what they see. Yeah. So I think that enhan enhancing that experience, I find I'm all for it. I think um, engaging the viewer because I, I believe as an artist, you know, my role through photography and mediating between the worlds that we don't generally see the world where our oil comes from or where our waste goes to and bringing that into our consciousness well it is a consciousness raising exercise to begin with right. so anything else that helps raise that 
that consciousness about our world around us with the viewer to me is is all good it, it, it's what you know me as a communicator and an artist uh, wants to see in terms of uh, uh, you know the viewer going away and having somehow shifted their consciousness a little bit towards wow I, you know I take you know driving around every day for granted but that comes from somewhere my car goes somewhere you know the, asking those kind of fundamental questions about existence and and urban existence in the 21st century is is as an artist uh, you know that's where I'm hoping that my work does. Uh, um, you know, contribute to, to, to that dialogue. I wonder, um, one sort of poll that a, uh, a museum director brought up to me, and I don't even know if I necessarily agree with this, I'd be interested to hear what all of us, or any of us have to say about this. Uh, he was talking, it was sort of a, a list of words and aspirations for a project, and two that we had next to each other, one was entertaining, and the other, another was challenging. And he said, I don't know if you can actually have those two things fit together, one to the next. He felt like those were actually in conflict. I have my own opinions, but I'd, I'd love to hear what people think about that, because it's, it's really at the heart of what you were saying, Ed, that you have these things that are, are challenges, but you, but you can't necessarily put giant blocks of didactic, either text or, or material that will make people recoil. So, so how do we find that balance between those two things, and are they necessarily in conflict? Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll speak to that, Jake. You know, I think that, uh, I, of course, I don't see them in conflict, because I, uh, but I think that there's a different word in between those two, which is um, more about engagement, and so that when you're faced with a challenge, you need some kind of handle. <laughs> and if it's an overwhelming challenge, it's not so entertaining, you know, and, and so I think a lot of what, you know, just, Ed, when you talked about the Post-it notes kind of posing some prompts about the, uh, what we think about oil, it's like a handle for the audience to hold on to and and you know they have a bunch of feelings because they've been through the show but now they, this gives them a way to hold on to it or perhaps uh, begin the dialogue and so it feels like uh, again you know what uh, one of the themes of what we're talking about is the the design of engagement or the engagement design that is kind of the aura around the museum experience that's kind of a new thing really and I mean it's it's or it's evolving from being um, uh, more didactic to more participatory, and it's it's really exciting. You know when you're oh sorry oh yeah you know when you're online and you're shopping and you know Google has this uh, algorithm that they use to kind of personalize your shopping experience by you know showing you things that you're interested in based on your history. I'm wondering if there isn't something like that that could guide an audience participant into a very unique experience of an exhibition so that in fact as they go through and as they're excited by certain things and gravitate towards something um, there could be a, a, a designed engagement that's specific to that audience member. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly you know where to go with that but I don't think it's beyond the, the realm of technology, I don't think it's beyond the realm of, of design to, to try to um, enhance the individual's experience within the context of the, the sort of general experience of the exhibitions. Jake, you should talk about how your um, accompanying iPad app for uh, Gallery One works to create a personalized tour. Yeah, definitely. So I, I was going to pipe in that's a lot of what we're doing at Cleveland. At the Gallery mm -hmm. One project is allowing people through this huge collections wall where they can see all 3,000 artworks to essentially uh, enter into any artwork and then to see other artworks that might be associated with it either by medium or by year. So you can see any artwork that was uh, created at the same time or by geography um, or by artists obviously and you can sort of jump from one to the next and as you're selecting individual artworks you're custom curating your own guide to the museum. And I think one of the things that the wall does really well is create this cross-section of all these different artworks on a visual level so it has a really powerful leveling effect um, and particularly in an encyclopedic museum like the Cleveland Museum of Art so much of the collection uh, will never be seen by visitors because they'll go to what they're familiar with they'll go to impressionism or maybe uh, you know one corner of Asian art but there's always going to be a lot of that museum that people don't necessarily think that they're interested in. Uh, so the capacity to have one place that sort of peaks 
that's designed to pique your curiosity about a lot of different things in the museum can be a powerful way to help guide people to explore and be surprised really by the museum experience. And while they're doing that, there's the capacity to get some of the context that Ed was talking about. So the iPad app is actually location aware. Uh, so it allows you to just click on a button called Near You Now, and it'll just show you the artworks that are around you and information about them. Or you can also hold up the iPad and use an image recognition algorithm to scan an artwork in front of you, and it'll literally point out hotspots on the painting that are of interest. Um, I'm, curi I'm curious what that does to the, the sort of status of the original artwork. Like, to me, that's a, that's a fascinating uh, interjection into, yeah. you know, my work is working with the actual work, and we all experience things more than ever online as a mediated type of image. Yeah. Um, and at the New Museum, we actually have on our website a first look online. That is work that is that is created specifically for that platform. Uh -huh. But to me, I wonder what that does to the to our experience of the object and the status of the object, the kind of, you know, the classic like aura of of the object of art. You know, are yeah. are we 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 try very hard at the new museum to give information, but to in terms of the work, but not to direct people onto what it means. Although we try and in some ways um, uh, shape an experience of some way, and that you know exhibition design helps you walk through an exhibition a certain way. You know, work two pieces together literally on a wall, they created a dialogue with one another. You know, there, mm -hmm. there are very traditional or non-traditional ways that you can create a story and use the objects or, or let them tell that story for you. But to me, I'm, I'm very curious as to, I, I know this is the way we are going in terms of how we, um, in terms of our relationship with images, but to me, I'm, I'm, I haven't been able to answer this question myself in terms of what does that do to the thing that a person has made that communicates in a way as a physical interaction with me as I see it, as I experience it, that's very different than if I'm looking at it online. And, sure. you know, scale, you, you don't have... Mm -hmm. You have a scale gets lost, a certain kind of presence gets lost, and I'm not. I'm very curious, basically, because mm -hmm. I think that's that's the way we're moving. But what does that do to work that wasn't made for that purpose? And and right. so then, what are we offering people in terms of an engagement with an artwork? Yeah, I mean, I think that from my standpoint, I'm super interested to hear what everyone has to say. Uh, kind of two points. One is that I think. Um, you know, artworks themselves have lots of different ways that you can see them, and definitely when you get into conceptual art, the physicality of the artwork is actually the, the least important or interesting part of it sometimes. Uh, and especially also when you get into media art, the envelope, the physicality of it is really mutable depending on where it's being presented. Um, so that's, that's one thought is that the artworks themselves uh, sometimes the physical presence is, is really critical, but um, sometimes it's not necessarily the form factor and the physical realization of it is not the most important part of it. Uh, but the second thing I would put out really is a provocation. Um, I, I really feel like the, the physical aura of the artwork and, and being in the presence of it uh, communicates you know, the core experience for the artwork itself. On the other hand, I think, uh, you know, there's the, you know, you could do a thought experiment um, where, for example, if uh, someone was a huge fan of Jackson Pollock and had, you know, seen all the paintings online and actually watched a lot of the interviews online and, and knew a ton about him and his work and, in fact, knew so much about it that if he came to the museum, he may not even see the physical artifact itself or what if this person can't actually go to the museum? Right, like they just have seen all this stuff in a mediated fashion, but in fact they know much more about the artworks, the stories behind them, the process of making them, who own them, the, the actual lineage both before and during and then after its creation. You know, you have put that versus someone who sort of um, skates through a gallery and glances at it and registers, yes, that's a Jackson Pollock. Like, who's actually having the Jackson Pollock experience, I think is a question that, that we need to ask ourselves because there's 
two places in theory that you can have art. You can have art in the artwork itself, or you can have art in people's experience of that artwork. And with all these contextual indicators that surround the artworks themselves, and this is everything from old-fashioned catalogs now to iPads and videos and participatory works that, that sort of uh, ring themselves around the artworks themselves, there's all these other ways to get into that art experience besides just being in front of the physical artifact. And so I think this is starting to get us in some ways there where, um, you know, I, I know just through anecdotes, there's a lot of dissatisfaction with a museum experience, both from an artist level and a curator level, because people sort of glaze their eyes over as they walk through, or maybe they, you know, they're either just listening to the audio piece, or there's a common complaint that people only read the labels and don't even look at the artwork. They're so busy reading what the curator has to say about it versus actually engaging with the artwork itself. Um, so I, I feel like the, the, the question about mediation is super interesting, but a lot more complicated than just like are people looking at stuff online or not because, you know, artworks have always been mediated even before museums existed. Uh, can I just step in for a second? I, I, uh, Charles, I have to head out. I have a, a curator who's here uh, who, and I have to leave at 1.15, but Marcus will... You, you have two other curators here in the room with us. I know, it's a, it's a tough day, I know. <laughs> it's been a great conversation, but Marcus will continue in my stead, and he'll fill me on to the rest of it. But thank you very much, it's been great. Thanks thank for you joining so us, Ed. Thanks for joining thank us. Thank you, Ed. You know, I, might, I could uh, just, I mean, that was really an interesting provocation, Jake, uh, and, you know, I think gets to the heart of the question, um, of, of, of the kind of current, uh, where we are now today. I think that to add to that, uh, that thinking or that, that provocation, I know you, I'm sure you think of this uh, in your work, I'm sure Jenny you do as well, what do museums have that, uh, that other media don't have? They have the physical space and they have the social environment, which is another factor of the physicality that is so critical and I think there's a lot of work uh, being done right now of re-envisioning the purpose of public space and why you go there because some of the incentives are changing to go, but, the, but they'll never change. And I, and I really like the show that's happening right now um, at the Museum of Arts and Design, which uh, called After the Museum. I don't know if you've uh, had a chance to see that, any of you yet, but it's, it's interesting in that it is full of provocations, but the way that the curator um, is thinking about it, and uh, it, is, is, uh, he describes it as a, an, an ecosystem around a discussion. So yes, there's the physical aspects of going to the space, there are events, there are debates, there's discussion, there's online activity, and they've curated this whole ecosystem of conversation around a topic, which I feel is very contemporary and very modern. One of the things that they have in the show is an artist who is kind of throwing a wrench in the whole works and has a 3D printer and opening up the 3D printer to open source contributions from the public to put their object in the museum and really uh, just create some interesting questions. Um, so, uh, but to, to ground all that, I really think that, the, you know, that idea of the museum as ecosystem around a topic is uh, an interesting direction where things are going. I, I just love this idea of, of the um, nature of curation, right? What is it that, uh, that you just bring up there, Gideon? Um, mm -hmm. There's a decision that's been made by a curator to place a work of art in the context of a museum. Um, they do that based on their own knowledge, um, all of that information they have about the artist and the, the art movement and history, and uh, there's a whole huge story that the curator brings behind making that decision um, to place it there. And so I, I believe, from my perspective, certainly as a museum goer, that having a glimpse into uh, that context, into that backstory, if you will, is, is hugely valuable and meaningful. Um, not that I want to be totally distracted from the experience of seeing the art or, or right. be, have it hidden from me. I mean, I, I, I've had conversations with curators about bringing iPads into the museum context where they say, oh, we don't want to do that because no one will look at the art and they'll bump into each other. <laughs> you know? and, and I'm curious, actually, if, you, if anything like that comes up at Cleveland. Uh, but I think, it's, I think that there is a tremendous value for bringing the story uh, that, that the curator has to light to the audience to create greater meaning and connection to the art. Right. Uh, I mean, I think it's really, from our standpoint, um, a 
you know, age-old interface problem, basically. Like, if you think about the gallery space as a space to be in the presence of the artwork itself, it's very, very clear you don't want to distract away from the artworks. It's also clear if you leave visitors with no context, uh, they become unhappy and disoriented. Um, but it's also clear once you add in too much context, it can potentially overshadow or distract you from the artworks. And that's why, again, my sort of parable of the chairman of the board uh, is really what you want. You want to be there, not, you know, you don't want anyone interrupting you, but the second you, something occurs to you about this artwork, you want to be able to turn to the head curator or to the artist themselves and say, well, tell me about that. That's, that's super interesting. Why do you think that? And have a conversation with them about that and understand. Uh, that is a very, very, you know, rarefied experience, but in our work, we're trying to build interfaces that allow you to do just that so that, you know, there are museum that are being evolved that have no labels, uh, where everything is location aware, where you just are in the presence of the artworks as visual experiences themselves. And, it, and in some ways it does demand that you engage with the artworks even more because there's nothing to label it until you ask and say, well, tell me more about that. And then you can find out more about that. But you haven't prejudged. And in some ways, uh, you know, the, the more idiosyncratic the organization of a museum, uh, the more engaged the visitors are in the same way that if you're walking through a well-trodden commute to work, you're not noticing uh, the different signposts or the different things that surround you. But if the first time you walk through a special part of a city or you're taking a hike through a forest, you have heightened senses and awareness. Uh, so if you imagine, uh, well, I used to go to MoMA and I'd sort of plod through the greatest hits uh, in linear fashion, but maybe now it's a little bit uh, more unorthodox, and there's some pieces I'm not familiar with, or maybe the organization itself is unorthodox. And I think increasingly, uh, you know, museums and even artists are aware that that defying or challenging people's uh, assumptions or expectations can be one of the main tools that they have to actually get people to engage with the artworks themselves. You can't leave them completely lost and disoriented, but uh, being uh, one of the phrases we use for orientation wayfinding is being comfortably lost, right? You have some sense of where you are, uh, but not so much that you're not paying attention to these things. I, I just also wanted to add that I, I love in this conversation that we're also talking about expanding the museum experience. We're expanding it to the pre-visit to the exhibit, yep. and we're expanding it to the post-experience. Uh, so. The, the phone calls and having every payphone in the city be, a, in effect, an invitation to come to that exhibit is, is I think, brilliant. Um, and Jake, the ability for somebody to not only have created their own um, favorite hits tour of the exhibit, but also then to take those pieces of art on their iPad home with them, where they could then learn more about them. And I remember as a kid, I used to go and buy the postcards for the favorite pieces that I saw when I was at the exhibit. Mm -hmm. Now I can bring that home with me on my iPad and email it to my friends or, or print it out and put it on my wall. So I just think it's, it's, or I'd like to have other people's thoughts about this idea of the museum experience as this continuum uh, of, of pre and post experience. Well, just speaking from our point of view, we found that <clears throat> because of uh, the uh, if you, if you guys recall the uh, Manufactured Landscapes film, mm -hmm. the one that kind of traces ads trip through China, um, we found that there is a fairly strong audience reaction both from people who went to see the film before seeing Ed's work uh, of the China work and the, the oil show, and, and also people who had seen that and then seen the film afterwards. Um, the audience reaction was pretty strong because they began to start start making connections between the process that the artist goes through to get what he has to do to mm -hmm. put his camera down in front of something and how difficult that is, uh, the, the kind of research that's involved, kind of negotiations that's involved, kind of costs that are involved, kind of team that's involved. Uh, uh, essentially, people don't see all that stuff. So we found that the, the, the reaction was extremely positive for the most part, and somehow also I find a bit demystifying. So that, in, in, in a sense, that the more the audience knows about how you know how things get done, the more they're intelligent about the process. But also how I think, in some cases, it, it, it kind of robs the image of something. It kind of mm -hmm. it kind of informs the image with so much stuff, 
that there's less and less room for the audience to to imagine something that's going on there. And right. so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword, really. Don't you think, Marcus, that might be based on personality type? Um, again, the type of visitor, I think I would always be the person who would always want to see the How They Did It movie, and it would make it even better, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and then I think another personality type coming to the museum would have that other feeling of it actually sure. detracts from that. Yeah, so absolutely. maybe what we're talking about is a range but, of... But, but, but then what you're, what you're alluding to, though, is the, is the individual again, right? And how the individual, in every case, responds differently to all the stimulus and how mm -hmm. they put how they pack it all together. And I think it's interesting. I'm not saying one's good, one's bad. I'm just saying those are the dynamics and the range of things involved in the audience experience of, of, of the artwork, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, I think they get closer to the, the thought processes um, of the artist in some in ways that that to seeing an artwork doesn't allow them access to. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of where you guys are heading, and I think it's a really good idea. Uh, open it up, open it up to to bigger bigger component constituent elements about the process of making art and experiencing it. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I guess does that okay. point to does that go to the example that Jake was giving of you know the chairman. Or the you know the president of the board who has access to the work and experience of the work when the artist does the you know the VIP walkthrough are we is this a way to um, democratize the process in a way you're opening up so everyone has access to this information does that empower them yes I, I also feel like again are, are is there something about the demystification but then somebody always has the choice to watch it or not or to, mm -hmm. I mean already I watch people move through the exhibition there are people who don't read any labels and there are people who obsessively read every single label so in a way right. I think w we can uh, leave it to the audience that they can make the decisions of how much information they want and I and and um, we are the ones that can empower them by giving them that information how they choose to use it is 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 up to them but it you know it is a tricky uh, I, I also, the the it's funny. I, I often have these conversations with artists, and they tell me I really want to slow the viewer down. You know, walking through a space, I want them to take the time with my work, and I, I see it happen every time I try and delicately explain that I've never seen a painting slow somebody down as much as I've seen a moving image whether it is a video piece or whether it is a, you know an interfacing <laughs> application we are trained now to spend more time because a progression of images creates a narrative and we want to see where that narrative arc is going to go and so I'm always trying to explain that I don't think I've ever seen anybody stop someone in their track it's a personal experience but but uh, you know I I've, we as we try and figure out a way to bring technology and a certain kind of interface that we've become very used to and in a way you know addicted to or, or dependent upon how that can compare or compete uh, or support something that doesn't have that capacity or that function you know it's it's a very interesting it's a you know I'm lucky to be able to spend a lot of time in a space with a variety of, of visual information and to see how people as we all do it seems to see how they uh, navigate that and 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 how do we as curators and I think it's also interesting the evolution of the word curator because it's used in so many different platforms it's it's also become another tool of empowerment that you can curate your music selection you can curate right. your you know design selection it's 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 also become more democratized thank goodness it doesn't have such an elitist connotation as it once did but I, I just I wonder you know that interface is an interesting um, dynamic, and I think watching people try and figure out their relationship to it is a very—it's new. It's kind of uncharted territory. Well, it's this is like going, kind of like going to a salad bar, having to make decisions about how much can you put on your plate and what you're going to enjoy the most, and which one you want to eat first, and you know it's that kind of. You know, I think there's 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 all these options, right? And and, the, and I think what you're discussing too, Jake, is options and, and building options into the experience of, of uh, the, the, the audience that's going to um, pay attention to some artist's work. And the options can be inside the museum, can be outside the museum, can be in, in many different, you know, built in many different ways. 
Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I just uh, wrap up, I see that we're almost out of time. I think it's been amazing to hear everyone's uh, different points of view on this. I think one uh, sort of parting uh, thought in terms of synthesizing these pieces together is this idea about engagement. I mean, one thing that is clear is that um, in the great uh, scheme of things, we're at a time where we've gone from you know, information scarcity, not enough books to a time of great surplus. And so how we can offer that information and engagement to people around the artworks themselves, I thought the, 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 the point about sometimes you can either over-explain or you know, demystify an image uh, that can be counterproductive is a really good point to keep in mind as well. And all of these, you know, as Jenny was saying, are in some ways an interface question. How can you offer these different options while still uh, keeping that primary experience of meditating with the artwork itself uh, intact. You know, that's the brass ring for all of us as we move forward. Well, thank you, Jake. That's a great place for us to close up. Um, I want to thank everyone for participating today. This was really an amazing conversation. I know personally I'm going to take away a number of postcards from this discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and I thank you and hope that you'll all come join us on our weekly conversations uh, and at the Future of Storytelling this October uh, when we'll have the live event again here in New York. So again, thank you so much for being here with us today. Really enjoyed the conversation and look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Thanks, Thanks again. Thanks, Charlie. Bye-bye.